Welcome back to another exciting instructional video over AP Chemistry. Today, our focus is going to be on wrapping up unit number one. And to do that, we are going to focus on periodic trends. Now, as we go through and think about these periodic trends, I really want you to be able to recall what we discussed last time when we talked about Coulomb's Law, that there are two factors that have an impact on the attraction of different subatomic particles. One is the magnitude of the charge, and the other is the distance between the two subatomic particles. So as we continue to work through this, again, I want you to keep those things in mind and think about those as we look at the different trends that exist on the periodic table. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain trends in ionization energy, atomic radius, electronegativity, and electron affinity with specific respect to Coulomb's law. Understand that elements in the same group form compounds with a similar number of atoms, and compounds form from elements in the same groups tend to have similar chemical properties. Let's dive in. So periodic trends are simply patterns that we see as we either go across or we go up or down the periodic table. And these trends are very well rooted in Coulomb's law, so we need to make sure that we know it and we know it very well. The four periodic trends we are going to look at are ionization energy, atomic radius, electron affinity, and electronegativity. Now, ionization energy is simply the amount of energy required to remove an electron. And we're, we are going to look at each of these individual uh, properties or periodic trends going up and down a group as well as going from left to right on the periodic table. So ionization energy decreases as we go down a group. The reason being is that the outer electron shell is further away from the nucleus as we increase energy levels. And so as a result, that electron being further away is less attracted to the nucleus due to Coulomb's law, meaning that there's less energy required to remove that electron. So let's look at some of the examples here on the right. Lithium has an ionization energy of 526 kilojoules per mole. That is the amount of energy to remove that outermost electron from the atom itself. Sodium has an ionization energy of 502. The valence electron that is in the outermost shell is further away from the nucleus and therefore requires less energy to remove. Furthermore, there is also more nuclear shielding with more electrons being closer to the nucleus than the outermost electron of sodium. And we can continue that trend with potassium, noticing that it has a 525 kilojoule per mole ionization energy to remove that outermost electron. Now, as we go across the periodic table, ionization energy increases because as we go across the period, the number of protons in the nucleus increases, and therefore that means that there's greater nuclear charge in the middle. As we increase the number of protons, we increase the positive charge that is in the nucleus. And if we do that, there's going to be a greater attraction of the outermost electrons to that positively charged nucleus. That greater attraction is going to require more energy to remove that electron. So you think about going left to right in that second group there, you have three protons and lithium. And as you go across the periodic table, you have 10 protons in neon. Well, those electrons are gonna be attracted more to the 10 protons because the magnitude of the charge of the nucleus is greater than that of in lithium or anything prior to neon in that particular period on the periodic table. So as we can see here, the amount of energy required to move an electron going from left to right on the periodic table increases because as the number of protons increases, there is greater nuclear charge, which results in greater attraction of the valence electrons, requiring more energy to remove them. Now let's look at second and third ionization energies. Those are the removal of more electrons. Now notice in some of these steps, there is a large jump. So for example, in sodium, the removal of one electron requires 498 kilojoules per mole. However, this next electron to be removed after that is 4,560 kilojoules per mole. Well, if we think about what happens, sodium only has one valence electron in its outer shell. When we remove that electron, it becomes what we call isoelectronic with the noble gas that is before it, neon. Well, if we think about it, neon is all the way on the far right-hand side of the periodic table. So once we remove all of the valence electrons, we actually start removing core electrons. If we remove core electrons, we know that that's going to require significantly more energy than it would to remove valence electrons from the outer shell. And we can actually notice a trend here on the periodic table. Notice that in sodium, the first ionization energy is very low, but the second one's very high. And the reason for that is that sodium is in the first group, that was those uh, alkali metals, on the periodic table. Notice magnesium, the first two ionization energies are low, and then it becomes very difficult to remove electrons well. Magnesium is in the second group on the periodic table. 
So removing the first two electrons is going to be relatively easy because those are the valence electrons that exist in magnesium. The successive electron being removed after the first two is again a core electron that's going to require a high ionization energy to remove that electron. And you see the trend going down here for aluminum. So in the third group, the first three ionization energies are low, while the fourth one is high, and so on as you see it going down the periodic table. Additionally, you can see the charges that are present here as well, and think about that trend on the periodic table. Sodium typically forms a plus one charge, magnesium forms a plus two, aluminum a plus three, and you can see that the easy removal of one, two, and three electrons is shown in that particular table. So really make sure you're thinking about the differences between the uh, second, third, fourth ionization energies. And notice where that big jump is because that tells you a lot about the atom and where its location is on the periodic table. Next, let's focus on the atomic radius, which refers to the size of an atom. Now, again, we can think about this in the inverse way we think about ionization energy. As the radius of an atom increases, the easier it is or the less energy is going to be required to remove an electron from that outer shell because, again, it's further away from the nucleus. It has less columbic attraction uh, and therefore requires less energy to remove. Now, atomic radius is going to increase as we go down a group as subsequent energy levels are further away from the nucleus due to increased nuclear shielding. So as we increase an in energy level, those energy levels are further away from the nucleus and therefore the radius of the atom is simply going to get larger. Just kind of makes sense. Now, if we refer to the size of an atom in terms of going from left to right on the periodic table, the atomic radius is actually going to decrease, and that is due to the fact that we have an increasing number of protons in the nucleus going from left to right on the periodic table. The increasing number of protons in the nucleus increases the columbic attraction of the valence electrons to the nucleus, meaning that there is a greater positive charge as we go from left to right in the nucleus of these atoms. That increased positive charge is going to attract those valence electrons more and more as we go from left to right, and therefore the atomic radius is going to decrease. So again, you can think about these in terms of inversely related to the ionization energy of an atom. Now, electron affinity is the amount of energy released when an electron is gained, or essentially the likelihood to gain an electron. Now, this increases going across a period as electrons are added, outer shells are more full, they become more stable. But we do want to keep in mind that noble gases don't want to gain electrons as they're already stable. So it's really about what's most likely or what's going to get it closer to having a full outer shell of electrons. Having a full outer shell of electrons results in the lowest potential energy that is possible, and that's where atoms are most stable. So as a result, we go across a period outer shells become more full and more stable. So you look at lithium's not likely to gain an electron, it's more likely to lose an electron because it's easier to lose one to become uh, stable with helium, being isoelectronic with helium, than it is to gain seven to become isoelectronic with neon and so on. Now, electronegativity is the tendency to attract shared pairs of electrons in a bond. Electron pairs are going to be pulled towards the atom in a bond that has the smallest atomic radius. So you can really justify electronegativity the same way you would justify atomic radius. Those electrons would have a greater attraction to the nucleus of an atom with the smallest radius because of Coulomb's law. We know that electrons are closer to the nucleus, talked about that with distance with Coulomb's law, are going to have a greater attraction to that nucleus than one with a larger atomic radius. So let's explain why the atomic radius of chlorine is smaller than that of sulfur. Well, we notice that sulfur and uh, chlorine are in the same period in the periodic table. Chlorine has a smaller radius than sulfur due to the extra proton in the nucleus of chlorine. This extra positively charged proton increases the effective nuclear charge on the valence electrons in chlorine, which results in the electrons being pulled closer to the nucleus due to Coulomb's law. So it really is all about making sure we think about the positives and negative charges and how that plays a role and the attraction between the nucleus and those valence electrons. And it doesn't hurt to throw in the term Coulomb's law uh, just to make sure that the reader has a very strong understanding of what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about valence electrons and ionic compounds. Now, bond formation specifically is determined by the interaction of valence electrons and the nuclei of other elements. We're going to dive more into that in the next unit. But some things you want to keep in mind is that elements from the same groups on the periodic table tend to form analogous compounds. So let's take, uh, for example, magnesium. If we look at magnesium on the periodic table, it has a plus two charge. And uh, let's look at the uh, negative two charge column. So magnesium and oxygen are going to bond in a one-to-one -one ratio. Those charges cancel, just like what we've talked about previously. 
So Mg and O would form. MgO is a compound. Well, if we go down uh, the minus two group, Mg and S would form MgS. It's the same kind of concept, the same one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, if we did Mg and F, Mg is a plus two, F is a minus one. So that formula is going to be MgF2. And as we go down that group, it would be MgF2, MgCl2, MgBr2, MgI2. We also do need to keep in mind that when these similar compounds form based off of similar columns in the periodic table, that many of these compounds have very similar chemical properties as well. Charges on atoms are determined by their periodic location. Again, that's determined by the number of electrons it either gains or loses in order to satisfy the octet rule. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you go through and uh, think about these different compounds and how they might bond with one another. So hopefully you can explain and understand all of these different trends due to Coulomb's law. Explain how elements in the same group form similar compounds with similar number of atoms and the fact that those are going to have similar properties as well. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, make sure you let me know and we will see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye.